Just uh, by way of introduction, uh, my background is in, in politics um, and I was a member of parliament until uh, last year and uh, as was said, a foreign office minister. I wouldn't normally mention I was a home office minister apart from my secretary of state was Theresa May, so that period in my life has uh, aroused greater interest from people who want to psychoanalyse our new prime minister who is after all quite an elusive figure I think for quite a lot of people, uh, not fully formed in terms of her character and people's understanding of her instincts. But I started about a year ago at the City of London Corporation with the remit of promoting the city across the European Union. The thinking behind that was that the City of London is not just a financial centre for Britain. Uh, we have outgrown our host country. We are Europe's global financial centre. We're certainly Europe's dominant centre, and I'll come back to that later. Um, and just as we engage with opinion formers, governments, think tanks, media and others here in our host country in Britain, we should logically, as Europe's financial centre, Europe's global financial centre, be doing that with governments, officials, think tanks, media and others right across the continent. So my remit is to be a permanent travelling salesman on behalf of the City of London. Uh, talking to those people about areas of mutual interest. And up until the referendum, the conversations tended to be dominated by issues like capital markets union, other manifestations of single market development, digital single market, uh, and so on. And then developments in the Eurozone, banking union, uh, in, uh, deposit insurance guarantee schemes, etc., etc. Uh, the bombshell, when it hit on the 23rd of June, has changed my role quite dramatically, not because those issues are irrelevant relevant to the City of London or to Britain, because they remain relevant and will do even after we've left the European Union. Uh, but obviously they are peripheral now compared to the big issue before us, which is uh, the terms under which Britain will leave the EU and the implications for uh, London as a financial centre. And let me start quickly by timing. I'm conscious that all of these issues have been touched upon earlier. But the way I think about the timing is just different ways of coming at the same issue. The way I think about the timing is actually more as a former British politician than anything else, which is that as a starting point, it seems inconceivable to me that the Conservatives will go into a general election in May 2020 with Britain still in the European Union. I just think it's very hard to explain to your electorate uh, when you are demonstrating that you have the ability to govern effectively and efficiently, that you have not carried out uh, the orders that the electorate gave four years earlier. Now we can have long conversations about how terribly complicated this is, but I just think intuitively for the average voter, they expect this to take a bit of time, but four years uh, I think would test people's patience and would cause unrest in uh, the Prime Minister's own party. And actually we can't obviously pull out the day before the elections, there'd need to be a respectable period. And there does seem to be a natural cycle uh, of us not having candidates put forward for the European elections in June 2019. Again, I think it would be bizarre and counterintuitive for most voters to be invited to vote for their MEP three years after they voted to leave the organisation. Uh, and there is that EU cycle, including the appointment of the Commission, which runs through till then as well. So I think there is a certain logic uh, in having the negotiations starting in the early part of next year and running for a two-year period through to the early part of 2019, which fits in with the political cycle. I also hear pressure from it uh, for that from various different quarters. So I travel widely across Europe. Most, uh, most weeks I'm in at least two other European countries talking to them about these issues. And some are quite relaxed. Those that are most naturally accommodating towards Britain are fairly relaxed about the timetable. But those who uh, agitate for uh, a new Europe of the 27 that can go forward um, at a faster rate, uh, unin uh, unhindered by uh, Britain dragging its feet, they want this process to be uh, got going sooner rather than later. I think there is some domestic political pressure uh, within Parliament 
Parliament from people who are most enthusiastic about Brexit uh, for us to get the show on the road sooner rather than later as well. And certainly here in the City of London, I think there is a widespread appreciation that this is a difficult process, uh, that we have a new Prime Minister, that she can't be expected to know all the details about everything on day one. There is a new structure of government. We can't have all the civil service apparatus in place with immediate effect. So people are forgiving up to a point. And I think people understand that there are months of process that need to be put in place or undergone before we can start negotiations formally. But they're only forgiving up to a point. And I think businesses are trying to plan, they're trying to think ahead, uh, they're happy, as I say, to tread water for a while and to do contingency planning, but I think they'd like a greater sense of certainty in the fairly uh, immediate future, certainly by the beginning of next year. So I think all of these pressures uh, suggest the timetable will go down that path. And I think one of the questions earlier slightly suggested that there comes a point in politics where everything, everybody believes something's going to happen at a certain point there's quite a high chance it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because it then becomes difficult for the government not to do it at that point and we may already uh, have got quite a long way into that space. The question then is what sort of deal we can put in place. And you hear all this talk about soft Brexit and hard Brexit and, uh, and the EEA options and Norway options. I increasingly am of the view that it is impossible to deliver the soft Brexit politically. Uh, now, a lot of people in the City of London, because most people in the City of London wanted, uh, wanted the Remain side to win, who are keen for the outcome to most closely represent Remain, even though the Remain side obviously lost the popular vote. Um, so people in the city would like us to be in the single market and have all the manifestations essentially of being members of the European Union, minus some of the obvious outward features like flags outside the European Parliament and attending some of the summits and having members of the European Parliament. But in economic terms, essentially to carry on as we were before. But whether you listen to Merkel or you listen to Hollande or everywhere I go uh, on the continent, uh, it is said, if you believe this, and we can discuss this, that being in the single market is conditional on the four freedoms, most particularly, uh, in our case, freedom of movement of people, and uh, it's contingent on us paying an ongoing budget contribution. And I struggle to see how any British Prime Minister could interpret the mandate of the referendum we had three months ago uh, as an instruction to carry on with exactly the same immigration policies uh, with regards to the rest of the European Union as we have had up until this point. I think for a lot of British people they are anxious about the volume of immigration, about the cultural change it brings. I think intuitively they struggle to see why there are more onerous restrictions put on place for New Zealanders coming here than Bulgarians coming here, for example. But I actually also think that um, Theresa May is not just constrained by public opinion. I think, and I've said this to some people in the city, I think it's worse than that from their point of view. I think she actually believes it. Uh, everything I've seen uh, working with the, the now Prime Minister leads me to believe that this isn't all for effect. That she thinks that the level of immigration into this country uh, is running at an unsustainable level and needs to be better managed. And what's more, she thinks that the British government uh, should be in a position to manage that directly. And I think there are quite a lot of Conservative MPs who don't just see this in terms of numbers, they also see it in terms of sovereignty that they feel that the ability to control who comes and lives and works in your country is an obvious manifestation of being an independent sovereign state. And if you don't decide who comes and lives in your country, you're not truly independent and sovereign. So I see this as a, you know, this is a formidable barrier. It's not just about trying to appease some voters in you know, Labour, UKIP, marginals in the north of England. I think it goes more fundamentally to the central beliefs of the government than that. And I think it's also impossible to sell to the British electorate that we should carry on paying the same membership fee for an organisation we have left than we did when we were a member of that organisation. I can just about see how we might be able to 
have some sort of single market access levy and effectively sort of rebrand some form of financial contribution. But I think paying at the level that we have been paying and continue to pay at today uh, is politically uh, undeliverable, or at least I can't see a way that it can be delivered uh, here in the United Kingdom. There's another issue as well, and I think Sir Malcolm Rifkin touched upon this, which is about how much we feel comfortable as a country with complying with single market rules uh, when we're not in ability to shape those rules. In other words, are we comfortable with sitting uh, in London as a, as the jargon goes, rule taker rather than rule maker, when the people sitting around the table making the decisions include countries that have no financial services sector at all and no specialism or insight or knowledge into this sector. I think a lot of people would find that perverse and difficult. And of course, if you look at wider public opinion, uh, single market rules don't just apply to exports. And I think it would be difficult for a British government to try and explain to a voter who is making a product which they only sell in Lancashire in 10 years time that the labelling on that product uh, needed to be changed because it didn't comply with single market regulations. The person would say, but I only sell it in Lancashire. And you'd say, oh, that doesn't matter, it's still in the single market. And they'd say, but we voted to leave 10 years ago. And say, oh, yes, but after we did that, we negotiated a deal where it all still applies anyway. I'm just thinking, in the minds of a politician, uh, whether the person at the other end of that conversation would find that a satisfactory answer. So all of those reasons, I wonder, uh, despite the best instincts of some people in the city, how deliverable a soft Brexit is and how much the government actually wishes to try and pitch for a soft Brexit in the first place. I think much more likely is the government will try and pitch for something at the softer end of a hard Brexit, if I can uh, put it in those those terms, that we have the most comprehensive agreement with um, with the European Union of any country in the world. And we do that because it is in our mutual interest to find that arrangement. And this mutual interest is multi-dimensional. So Sir Malcolm was talking about passporting into the UK as well as UK firms passporting out. I was in Sweden last week uh, at a dinner with a chief executive of um, quite a big Swedish bank, Handelsbank, have 207 branches, sounds like an advert, 207 branches in the United Kingdom from Truro to Inverness, he said. But they passport from Sweden into the UK market. Their biggest market is Sweden, but obviously this is a much bigger economy, and they anticipate that the UK will, all other things being unaltered, overtake Sweden to be their biggest single market, unless they lose their passporting rights, in which case that will complicate the picture. So it is a two-way street. It is a two way street. Although, of course, their 8,000 passporting in are probably passporting in a hell of a lot less value than our 5,000 passporting out. So I don't think people need to get overhung up on the, on the numbers, the 5,000 versus the 8,000. But I think it is worth understanding, and same as in goods, uh, that all of these processes are a two way street, even if the dominant flow is in one direction. The other issue uh, beyond the economy is there are a lot of countries in the European Union who have an attachment to Britain doing well uh, because of wider strategic interest. So it is interesting, for example, uh, to go to the uh, Baltic states uh, where their principal interest in staying close to the United Kingdom is that we are a leading member of NATO and we have a special relationship with the United States of America. Uh, they have less interest in passporting because they have very limited financial services sector. So the point I suppose I'm trying to make is that different countries uh, value different aspects of the relationship with, um, with Britain uh, and of course they have the difficulty in the negotiations uh, that they have to agree among themselves, the 27, whereas we should, I hope, be able to uh, agree among ourselves more easily seeing as we only represent one on that side of the table. The final bit is about the city of London. And this is, in a way, my, my biggest sell to European audiences and the hardest sell to make. Because I talk about trying to have this relationship where we are not willing to comply with their demands. This is not necessarily my favourite outcome, I'm just going through the scenarios I think are most plausible. We're not willing to comply with their demands on migration policy. 
Although there may be some wriggle room there, we may say that we want to control the immigration policy, but the policy we then put in place that we control is actually a more liberal, open, outward-looking policy than many people in the European Union might fear it would be. So there is some scope, maybe, for wriggling. There's a bit of scope as well on budget contributions, as I said. But if we can't meet their absolutist demands, and I struggle to see how we can, then we will put ourselves outside the single market and we will want the best relationship with the single market. And what people always say then is, well, we understand that with goods, because, you know, the French export more wine to Britain than they import from us, or cars from the Germans. But why would they want to give you that sort of deal on financial services? And it is true that everywhere that I go in the European Union, uh, almost without exception, they think that there is an opportunity for them to entice some jobs from London in financial services. And, of course, the scale is so... Uh, mismatched, that we have roughly 10 times more people in financial services in London than they do in Frankfurt. People think of these as sort of comparable centres. They're not. So if we lost, say, 2% of the people in London to Frankfurt, that would be a 20% increase in their workforce. Which, if you're the mayor of Frankfurt, sounds like quite a good morning's work in terms of selling that to your electorate. Uh, Paris would like to attract some jobs. Luxembourg, uh, Dublin, Milan, Madrid, Amsterdam, and others. What I say to all of them is, though I can understand why that might be in the narrow interests of those individual cities, well, though some of them be a little bit careful what you wish for, because some of them quite like the idea of attracting some jobs, but not too many. They worry about the implications of regulating and managing a big increase in their financial services sector. But I say it might be in the interest of those cities, but is it in the interest of the wider European economy? Because London is indisputably the global financial centre. And no one should assume that if a thousand jobs leave London, that those thousand jobs will all locate to somewhere in the European Union. Some will do, because there will be some tasks which will need to be formed, uh, performed within the European Union in that scenario. But some, I anticipate, would go to New York, some would go to Asia, some may cease to exist altogether because that area of activity is no longer profitable if it's not done in London. Uh, so London would become a diminished centre, uh, but it wouldn't be replaced by an alternative global financial centre elsewhere in Europe. There is only one plausible global financial centre in Europe for the foreseeable future, by which I mean decades and not years, and that's London. And London competes with New York and the big Asian markets. It doesn't compete with the European markets. So the question for European policymakers is do we wish to have a global financial centre on our continent? Ideally, it would be in the EU, but it's now not going to be. Or would we rather willfully try and diminish and sabotage the only plausible global financial centre on our continent in order to try and make a broader political point to the British? Even if that comes at the cost of meaning that it is more expensive for businesses across Europe to borrow money, uh, to uh, invest their pension funds, to exchange currencies into other currencies. So there is, this isn't just a sort of status point. Uh, it is a status point because we in Europe have 7% of the world's population and shrinking. We have about a fifth of the world's economy and shrinking. And you look at Europe from the outside and you think, what does Europe do that people around the world acknowledge and respect? And financial services in London is one of Europe's great assets. When the President of China was here for his state visit a year ago, he spent two nights here in this country. The first, he had a dinner at Buckingham Palace, hosted by the Queen. He was a guest of the British state, in other words. And the second night, he had a dinner in this building, hosted by the Lord Mayor of London. And that reflects, I believe, Chinese attitudes towards Britain. Their interest in Britain, we're a permanent member of the UN Security Council, we're a nuclear power, etc., etc. Uh, Britain, I think, still sort of matters in global terms. But what is the sector that they zoned in on and took greatest interest in? Financial services. And the reason they do that is because they can see what is self-evident of everybody around the world, that this is a global centre of excellence. And Europe does medium scale scale pretty well. What it struggles to do is global scale. And yet here we are, 
almost the sort of embodiment of Europe being more than the sum of its parts in this square mile. There is a certain irony, actually, that in all of these conversations, I uh, try and encourage people who are in every other way quite integrationist uh, in their thinking about European politics not to disaggregate a centre which is more than the sum of its parts by people across Europe working together to form that. Uh, even though I'm from a country that's just voted to leave the EU. And they all argue for trying to bring the services back to a sort of nation-state level and make it less than the sum of its parts again. But I think one of the arguments we need to prevail upon European governments, particularly through corporate interests in their own countries, is the value of uh, understanding that there is a loss in transitional terms of trying to diminish the City of London, but there's a loss in longer term uh, terms as well of not having uh, such a important financial centre in global terms. And that is my final, final point, which is where would you put everybody on the scale of these negotiations? I think there are people, if you like, it goes from the most political and ideological to the most economic and pragmatic. And you get differences uh, even within, well, between countries. So obviously you've got countries like Belgium, Luxembourg, France are more on the, this end of the scale. The European Union in its sort of institutional manifestations, Juncker, the European Parliament, uh, are more political in their approaches. And on the other end of the scale you get countries that are uh, well disposed towards us that have already by virtue of not joining the euro indicated a reluctance to go down this path so the Swedes for example the Czechs are in that sort of camp the Danes to some extent so there's those between countries you get it within countries even within governments foreign affairs ministries tend to be nearer this end of the scale more political finance ministries tend to be nearer this end of the scale even within the same government uh, and you certainly get it between the public sector and the private sector, with narrow commercial interests trying to prevail upon their own governments not to do something willfully destructive to try and send a wider political point about the undesirability of leaving the European Union. I think the people on this end of the scale, their principal objective, the most integrationist people, is to make sure that Britain is seen to lose as a result of leaving the European Union. So they seek a win-lose negotiation outcome. But they are so wedded to the importance of Britain being seen to lose, I think they would rather have a lose-lose outcome than have a win-win outcome. Because the crucial thing is not that they win, it's that Britain loses. In fact, I'd even go further and say they might be willing to suffer a degree of loss in order to inflict a greater loss on Britain. And I think it's very, very important, if we had one big strategic objective, is that the people who are in that state of mind are not controlling the EU 27 side of the negotiations. And there is, on the other side, a much more pragmatic outcome, which in due course I think can see the EU 27 uh, and Britain having a mutually beneficial uh, and deep relationship. But that requires a sort of calm nerves uh, and a plausible negotiation position from Britain and an understanding of where all the different arguments and forces come from within the European Union. And either way, I think it's going to be a, a difficult but interesting several years ahead.